the first two slides already talk about some of the stuff that we mentioned about the Beehive Collective, how we work, our process. This is the Grange Hall that we function out of that building I, I mentioned that we, we recuperated. And also, you know, a little bit of what I've already mentioned about the, the graphic campaigns and, and how we create those graphics. Here we title all the graphics that we've done and the time period that it took to create them. Here are also photographs of the research tour. Everything I mentioned about the sensitivity of going to communities and, and hearing their stories. So here are photographs of the true cost of coal graphic and how that one was created. And then there's some slides that I will skip over, but not this one. So polinización is the name of the process that we as Beehive Collective do in Colombia and in other places in Latin America, means pollinations in Spanish. And we're essentially a network of cultural workers that work with local peoples who are being impacted by extraction policy projects to develop communications and art skills to tell their own stories. So we've even seen this in my own community where they're building the dam, that people who are well-intended coming from the outside, they learn, they make a video or something of that nature, they create a lot of awareness about the problem, but within our communities, nothing changes. So we give a lot of focus on, instead of just going to a community and making our video or painting a mural, it's more important that we work with people, that they learn how to do this for themselves, and then by participating in this collective land defense process, they're also having a personal transformation and something that they will carry with themselves for the rest of their life. So we see that as much a more important strategy as part of these movements. When we started, we were really just doing workshops of the graphics in the different communities. And we were working with people to learn about these different issues that impact them through the, the banners themselves. Little by little, we got invites to do other projects in other regions, and we became what we are today, which is a network of cultural workers. So I will skip that map and that one. I'm going to look at some of our history. So some of the first stuff that we started to do in 2007 and 2008. In southern Bogota, in one of these neighborhoods that is characterized by a lot of violence and a lot of poverty, we work with a group called Creative Seeds, Semillas Creativas, that is a cultural resource center for youth within that community. And we did the workshop explaining the Plan Columbia graphic with the youth. The youth then drew the image that most impacted them. For instance, this girl here drew the image of the oral tradition. And then we did silk screening with the kids and their own designs, which for a lot of folks, maybe like in cities, might not seem like a big deal. But within this context, for a lot of this youth to be able to communicate and express themselves in such a way like on their clothes or things like that is very empowering for them. When I lived in South Florida, before I moved back to Colombia where my family, my mom's family is from, um, I participated in a movement called Take Back the Land that addresses the, the lack of housing for low-income black families, specifically families that are led by single moms. So what this organization or this movement does is, is housing liberations and land liberations for these families that, that need the housing. When I moved back to Colombia, activists from Take Back the Land were really interested in the reality and what was going on with black liberation movements within Colombia. So through an umbrella organization called the Process of Black Communities, we facilitated an exchange and two activists from South Florida came to two urban and two rural black communities and were able to learn about what their organizing looks like, what is going on, on the ground, what reality is for them, and specifically learn a lot about gold mining, which is a major issue in these communities. Some years later, one of the people from the communities that hosted us, we were able to bring them to the United States, and they have also had exchange with different black liberation movements within the United States, in Atlanta, in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York. So remember what I was talking about at the beginning about this mentality of extraction that exists all over the world? In South America, it's being manifested as this big thing called IRSA. And IRSA is this really long, confusing acronym that, may, that means Regional South American Infrastructure Integration Initiative. It's the same that, I've, you know, we talk about tar sands, and I'm pretty sure you, all, you have the idea, the concept. The only thing I would like to emphasize is that they have divided South America up into hubs of how these projects will be implemented. And the hubs that we will be looking at that most impact the region where we are present are one and nine, the Andean hub and the Amazonian hub that you can see at the top. 
So this is where we focus our work today, this beehive collection within Colombia. La Guajira is a desert Caribbean peninsula, native to the Wayu people, who we're going to talk about briefly. Putumayo is an Amazon region on the border of Ecuador. And Huila is an Andean river valley characterized by a lot of agriculture and is where I am based, where my family is from. I mentioned the Wayu are the original people of La Guajira Peninsula. Here you can see the traditional territory in red. This was created by a Wayu artist. And I'm, we're going to look at some maps to understand how the Wayu see their own territory and then how it's being intervened by these different policies that are, are seeking to take things up. The Wayu have a clan system. So their clans are located, their cemeteries are located in clan territory. Not necessarily them as, as living individuals, but once they pass, their remains have to return to these clan-specific cemeteries. So this is how they, another way they organize their own territory. Mm -hmm. We look at what happened today. What is red remains Wayu territory. What is purple is oil and gas extraction. And what is brown, blackish brown or gray at the bottom is the world's largest open pit coal mine, known as Cerrejón. Everything that is like a block is where they want to do fracking. Which is kind of like everywhere. And this map has details from both the Colombian and the Venezuelan side. The Burgundy line is the international border. On your right hand side is Venezuela, and on your left hand side is Colombia. So to give you an idea of everything that's happening within YU territory. The yellow are active coal mines. And the orange is wherever they can expand whenever they feel like it. This pink is the rail line where coal is taken out. These grayish blobs are the reservoirs of three different dams. The green area at the top is natural gas extraction. The purple is oil extraction. And the turquoise lines are gas pipelines. The red areas at the very top and over there are national parks. So, I'm going to talk about something that's going to come up a lot of times in this presentation. When I talk about prior and informed consultation, the way that the state and the companies have gotten around to consult in local communities is to selectively kill certain people and use terror to displace those that are alive. And when they are physically not on their territory, to demand those rights of prior informed consultation, the companies can come and do whatever they want and they don't have to talk to anybody because they can just say nobody was there. So that's a tactic that we're seeing a lot. This middle area, the red one, is a national park that was created just last year called Portete Bay. When we as the Beehive go to Colombia in 2007, we are invited because this is the location in 2004 of a massacre where 13 women uh, and children of Wayu people were killed and the 300 survivors were displaced to Maracaibo, Venezuela, around here. When this happened, because of the proximity of the port, we all were convinced that they were coal mining interests behind the massacre. But what has happened in the last couple of years, specifically last year, actually showed us that they are, what we were talking about, this, this conservation, this, this carbon trade that was behind the violence that was inflicted upon this territory, all in the name of conservation. The process that we work with in Colombia is called the Strength of Wayu Women. They are a movement. The Wayu are traditionally a matrilineal people. So our work um, with them is very much focused on empowering all the young people, but especially women. Because they're a matrilineal people and Colombian culture is very machista, their own decolonization process is about women regaining their role as, as decision makers and power holders in Wayu community. And it's to say that also why you men participate in this process that have this reflection of what their decolonization would look like. Most of their work is against the Cerrejón coal mine, but to be noted, they also have been targeted by the right-wing paramilitaries that selectively kill people and, and massacre communities. Most of our work with them is with youth, with the youth on the use of the graphics on retaining land-based knowledge in terms of animals, folklore, medicinal plants, things of that nature. Oh, I'm going to go back a moment. So this river is where we're going to go look now. It's called the Sokoy River. And there are Wayu communities in Venezuela along this river 
that for the last 15 years have been protecting it from coal mining. Their organization is called Mighty Ralasali, which means not for sale in the wide Nike language. And in addition to the coal mining resistance, they are all about creating agroecology and permaculture projects. They have their own film school, have had, made their own movies. We're going to see one at the end. They have a red footed tourist rehabilitation program. They've installed solar panels. So they've been pretty innovative about how they're going to resist the coal mining in their territory. We go to the Putumayo region, the Amazon. Here what we see is, so this is like to understand hydrology and how much, how absurd this is here. The green is what's protected. <coughs> the blue will be areas where oil extract, oil exploration can occur. The red are active oil blocks where they're taking out oil as we speak. And the orange are ones that are currently um, being kind of like debated negotiation between different oil companies that want to take those on. So if the rivers flow left to right, the Andes are on the left, the Amazon is on the right, and we have a spill in one of these blue areas that's upriver from the green area, what difference does it make to have a protected area if you're downriver from where the oil is being extracted? Utumayo is the Amazonian region. We're talking about Colombia's 60-year-old civil war having a heavy influence in this area, as well as all the other pro problems associated with the war on drugs. This is the area that we're going to focus. The Putumayo River, which is a major river in the area, they want to turn it into a canal. They want to dredge it to continue to take oil out and use big barges. There's about four or five different First Nations peoples that live along this river. And they've been taking oil out since the 60s. And as part of the war on drugs, the fumigations of glyphosate, known as Roundup Weed Killer by Monsanto, have been fumigated in this area for close to 20 years from planes, something that's illegal actually in the, US, the United States to do with Roundup, fumigated from a plane. Not only are the crops associated with coca and heroin production impacted by this, but also forests, rivers, um, food crops, and people themselves. It is very normal to see children in Putumayo with rashes from head to toe because of being exposed to these fumigations. So remember that, that the channelization of this river and remember this highway that's going to go across the entire Amazon because we're going to get to communities that have been directly impacted by these policies. Um, we're going to skip this map. A local process we work with is a communication school, the Intercultural Communication School, that mostly does audiovisual work with, with youth in the area, but not exclusively. The Siona people were displaced from the Putumayo River where they lived because of selective kills. They killed some people, the rest of the community had to leave, and now the country is being able to dredge the river without having to consult them. This is one of the few communities where we do not have our own plan when we enter, but basically the mothers in the community tell us what to do. We just show up with our, our materials and they guide us and the use of views in the graphics and recuperating traditional knowledge and maintaining the language, the Siona language. So you can see a library we started with them and you know, some other things, coloring and whatnot. The Kofan people are also found on both sides of the border. Uh, this right here is Ecuador, where they're sitting, and that over there is Colombia. So their area is super militarized. All the border guards come in their territory, all the armed groups, all the army, nobody respects it whatsoever even though they won't get in their face. Like these people with big arms and they don't have anything. So they're constantly in this process of land defense. These folks are impacted by the highway. They want to send the highway through the middle of their area. And we are working with them to develop their film capacity, as well as um, something else I'll mention later about creating curriculum. They want to do homeschooling with a decolonized aspect to their education. And we're helping them develop that because one of our BHAG members in Colombia is actually an indigenous elder that's a university professor who's worked a lot in indigenous education, so the, the coming together to help create this, this methodology. Rios Vinos movement is a movement I'm a part of. It is the anti-dam movement in Colombia. Um, we are all the dam-impacted communities. We were born in the 90s as a network. Since 2011, we are a movement. Some of the basic principles, we are an anti-capitalist movement. Capitalism is the root of the problem that has created all of this. But we are also not a traditional um, environmentalist movement, and we're not a traditional like uh, people's social movement. We are we are made up of 
um, peasant farmers, indigenous people, and Afro-Colombians. And we are critical of traditional environmentalist groups and traditional human rights framework because neither we don't fit into neither of them. So the second I issue is what I'm talking about here. Since I moved back to my territory, my life is tied to my river. And daily, like everybody in my community, I need to be able to walk my territory and walk alongside my river to know that. So if I'm a gold panner or I fish or I gather honey and medicinal plants, I need to be able to accompany and walk my territory freely, just like my river needs to be able to complete its hydrological cycle. If the river and I are not able to do that, we are not free. According to the human rights framework, though, none of my rights have been violated, even though my right to life is totally being detained by this. Until I'm killed, human rights free framework doesn't care about it. And then most environmental groups don't care about it because you know, people are living off of the land because that is how we've always lived. We live from the land. Um, the idea of supermarkets and health clinics and hospitals is relatively recently, and it's not like they're that good. You know, highly processed foods, highly industrialized drugs. People want to keep the relationship to the land. I already mentioned this earlier, we do not believe in the carbon trade or dams as green development. Um, we are very steadfast that we will remain in our territories. Colombia, after Syria, has the most amount of internally displaced people in the entire world. We don't want to be refugees or immigrants or migrants. We will remain in our territory. But when we say remain in our territory, we mean it with dignity. And what I mean by dignity, um, kind of to ground that idea, is we don't want to have to depend on handouts from the government or the companies to be able to remain there. And for us, dignity is, is, is autonomy. It's that ability to exercise self-determination. And it's control over food, health, education, um, identity and culture. That's what we conceive as identity, excuse me, as dignity. The green areas are part of the Rios Vivos movement. The red areas are areas that we accompany. But more important than like these areas is the fact that we organize by river basin, by watershed. We don't organize by state or by department. We are talking about organizing and saving our rivers, so it only makes more sense to organize by watershed. Um, the political boundaries that separate part of a river from another part of the river means nothing if there's a spill or something of that nature because it goes throughout the watershed. Um, yep, yeah, this one that I hit. I mentioned the Civil War in Colombia, I mentioned, mentioned violence, we noted our movement does have martyrs. These are just some of the people who have been killed. The elder in the lower right hand corner is Said Pedraza, he is an elder from my region. He passed away a couple of years ago. To be noted that many of the elders are impacted by the anxiety and the, the psychological trauma of being removed from territories that they have only known their entire lives and they never have lived anywhere else. So Saeed is one of about a dozen elders who have passed in my region because of this. The other gentlemen that we see here um, have been people that were either assassinated or disappeared. And specifically, the person in the upper left-hand corner which is a leader of the Embera Catillo people. In the false demobilization process of the paramilitaries, when the paramilitary leader Carlos Castaño was asked why they killed Kimi, he said very specifically it was because of the dam. Because Kimi was blocking the dam. Um, and just to give you an idea of how disproportionate this is, last year in Colombia we had about 25 environmentalists assassinated. That made us number two in the entire world for environmentalist assassinations. Number one is India. India has a billion two hundred thousand people. Colombia has forty-eight million. So it's kind of disproportionate for us to be number two. There are some slides I'm going to skip over a little bit because the video we're going to see is going to get more into the detail. This is the Kimo Dam. It's the dam that impacts the region that I'm from. My village, La Habwa, is from right here, the tail end. Those photos are about a month old of the growing reservoir that started to be filled on June 30th of this year, unfortunately. And, you know, 26,000 people are impacted. It's a reservoir of 21,000 acres. Our local process against that is known as ASO Kimbo, the Association of Affected Peoples Against the Kimbo Dam. It's made up of different committees that represent all the sectors. Through assemblies, we make decisions. And our main strategy of land defense is direct action. Land liberations, road blockades, marches, um, public building occupations, things of that nature. Um, we do do legal actions, but they are always secondary to our primary direct actions. As I've mentioned, impunity reigns in Colombia. So, you know, you can have all the lawsuits you want, 
but if you don't have the force to make those lawsuits be respected, they're not going to do anything. In my community, which is called La Hagua, we are originally a community of indigenous origin that has a very complex history of native peoples being enslaved from other areas and forcibly relocated to our territory and then mixed with the folks who already live there. Um, needless to say, our elders are very colonized. They do not self-ID as indigenous. Our languages have not been retained. But folks still do still heal with plants. They fish and plant according to lunar cycles. They weave. Traditional natural building architecture is still done, wattle, wattle and daub, sticks and mud. Uh, they weave cast nets, so, um, you know, decolonization has to be done, but at least we have something still. We use these mural paintings as a way of incorporating people into land defense, but also learning about the land that they're defending. So these murals are actually the result of hikes and interviews with elders, because we're depicting the very things that we're protecting and that are present within our territory. And we want the youth to be able to understand better what it is that is there and that land-based knowledge. So the mural painting is, is, you know, more than just painting, it's learning about where we're from. And it's doing these hikes and whatnot to have this better knowledge. Mm -hmm. The petroglyphs that you can see here were done by our ancestors about 3,000 years ago. And the paintings below were the versions that the youth did. Um, this mural was created over three days, about 50 people participated, the youngest being about five years of age, and the oldest being of about 75 years of age. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, the wall is an adobe wall that's 200 years old. It was about to fall down, and we repaired it in a collective work, and then we painted it as part of that collective work. There is an online platform called Project Noah for geeks who like wildlife photography, and we use it as a mechanism to create our own crowdsourced um, environmental impact statement about the dam. The companies usually are the ones to do their own impact, environmental impact statements, which they will leave a lot of information out that is not convenient for them to be published. So to counteract that, we do it ourselves, and we make it public through this platform. When the dam company did the study about seven or six years ago, they only mentioned 200 species in the area, and we already have about 265 mentioned, and we're going on more. And you can see some of our non-human neighbors that live in that area. Oh, sorry. Um, this is how they want to completely destroy the Magdalena River with 17 dams in Dredgen, or completely, the country's most important river, but we'll see that more in the video. This is a process that we did with people all over the region, mostly youth, but in the skills building, of uh, dance, performance, puppetry, and theater based on movements that you lose with the river. You lose these movements when you lose a river, like a triple somersault into the water, or floating down in an inner tube or throwing a cast net. If there's no river, people won't do these movements anymore. So using these movements as the basis for theater productions in public spaces, in visible theater, to really get people reflecting about everything that will be impacted by this. We also did a film creating process as part of this, and the youth also made videos um, about what we're doing. So Oporapa is a community struggling against another dam, and the communities in the Yagilka Creek are resistance against fracking, and we have worked with them in the use of arts as part of the strategy, but also in the use of phone, of, uh, phone trees to create mechanisms of land defense. So you, know, you see engineers coming on their land to do studies, and I call two people on a cell phone, and those two people call another two people, and those two people call another two people, in about half an hour, we can have 1,500 farmers surrounded them, each with a machete in hand. Politely, but sternly, they will tell them that they have to leave. Why? Because. This is what we have in store for the next couple of years. With the YU, we're going to do the Project NOAA stuff. They actually really like the idea of the wildlife photography against the coal mine. They want help to recuperate different agroecology processes that they have. They want to recuperate the practice of the stingless honeybees, the melipona bees, which can be seen there. And they actually want to create a beehive style poster about them as a people. We've told them that if it's going to be useful to Wayu people as a people, they need to make it, not us. So we're going to accompany that process and help them mm -hmm. um, really work out the methodology of how they can create one of these graphics as an educational tool. For the Putumayo folks, we're going to help keep on making videos as well as create the curriculum for that homeschooling, 
and for the entire Vinos Vios movement, not just the Lula region, where I'm from, we are going to do an action tour that helps the local <coughs> processes develop the different arts and communication strategies as part of land defense. And we will also do the research to create a graphic like these about the struggle against dams in Colombia. And there are many ways that people can help. Um, first way is, you know, there's always money. Unfortunately, capitalism still exists. And if you have a bunch of money you don't really need it, you can take it off your hands. <laughs> there's also all these goods that are made by the communities that we work with. The posters are from the collective. All the goods are made by the communities that we just saw in the, in the slideshow. They all have been fairly um, compensated for the goods and they know that all the proceeds from what is being sold will go to continue developing these projects within those communities. We also, you know, a lot of times in the north it's sometimes easier to get a hold of like old used digital cameras or disk drives, things like that. Those are always a big help down there. Getting these big banners as well. You can imagine a cloth banner that can be washed in soap, last a little bit longer in a hot, humid, tropical climate than a paper poster. And even though we do speak harshly about tourism, we are not against people visiting. Actually, people really like visitors. They really appreciate it. But you have to know what intention you have when you go to these communities, what you're looking to build with people, um, how, what type of commitment you're looking to create, and folks are really open. There's a large variety of skills that people are always looking for help to develop. And you know, it's, it's just as simple as asking and knowing what's going on. And we have one 11 minute film and one six minute film. The first one is about the anti-dam movement in Huila. El río es libre, el río lo necesitamos libre, el río es una fuente de trabajo para muchas familias. Yo me contaba que antes no había carne y decían pongan la olla que me voy a traer el pescado para el almuerzo. Dijo mi papá, y íbamos y hacíamos dos, tres tiros con la taralla y, y ya cogíamos lo del pescado y no se venía. Dijo mi papá y había tanto pescado. Todo aquí, esta parte era nuestra, nuestra playa. El río, mejor dicho, el río por lo general era nuestro. De toda esta población, ¿no? de todos podíamos andar, ingresar muy tranquilamente y a la hora que quisiera y como quisiera. Ir a hacer paseos de olla, ir a, a pescar, así fuera por simplemente irse a bañar a la hora de que usted quisiera irse a bañar. Imagínese la belleza de mi pueblo con dos ríos y a cinco minutos cada río. Una vida digna es lo que teníamos. ¿sí? 
teníamos la pesca, teníamos el trabajo, teníamos todo, todo. No teníamos plata, pero nos sentíamos bien, tranquilos, nadie nos molestaba. Y teníamos todo, usted trabajaba, había trabajo, cualquiera lo buscaba, le daba, daba el empleo. Y ahora, ahora está esto muy difícil. Ahorita hay empleo, pero por la multinacional, porque ella está empleando para hacer todo lo que tienen que hacer, pero deje que ya se vaya. ¿Quién nos va a emplear? Y los, que, los empleadores que teníamos aquí se marcharon, vendieron su finca y se fueron. Mi nombre es Carlos Wilfredo Hernández, tengo 58 años, a de 50 vivo en, en el río Magdalena, vivo de la pesca. Yo todo estoy subiendo doble desplazamiento que a mí me desplazaron de allá y me vine para acá y aquí están haciendo lo mismo. Cuando la represa de Tania también me sacaron de herradura. Nosotros teníamos una islita allá y esa isla no la inundó la represa y nadie dijo tomen cuando sea esto para para que trabaje, para que siga trabajando, no, nadie, nadie nos dio nada porque eso no tenía escritura porque era en medio del río. Y no, por eso nos tocó que seguir para acá para arriba. Los de aquí, esta comunidad, Prácticamente se vivía del jornal que se hacían en las fincas que la empresa adquirió supuestamente para reasentamiento. O sea, la empresa reasienta a unos para joder a otros. Y, y los que estábamos eh, laborando en esas tierras quedamos pues desplazados, o sea, perdimos el derecho al trabajo. Ahora el río Magdalena, en la, la, dependemos de toda la pesca aquí en el, en el río Magdalena, el río Suárez, y prácticamente eso se acabó. Si sí, con Betania se, se veía como, como exterminado esto ahorita con el Quimbo, pues a veces es cierto que no cogemos en nada. Y fuera de eso nos quitan Las Vegas, porque aquí hay gente que producía en Las Vegas, tenía sus tierritas en la cual producía la comida para aquí la comunidad y para sacar a Garzón a, a, a vender los productos. O sea que prácticamente nosotros quedamos eh, sin, sin alimentos, sin trabajo y sin nada. O sea, en unos años ya nos toca es mendigar o robar o aguantar hambre. Estamos diciendo, no, no, señor, no, 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 señor no, 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 defensor, ¿existe o no el derecho a la protesta? Sí. Entonces, lo que nosotros estamos haciendo es ejerciendo ese derecho. Sí, nosotros no estamos bien. bloqueando nada. Exacto, si no hay bloqueo, no hay ningún problema. Exacto, entonces, no ¿por qué nos van a desalojar? ¿Por qué los de GESA dicen que se bloqueó? Y le estamos diciendo al Estado, no queremos salir del territorio. Tenemos derecho a vivir en el campo colombiano. Tenemos derecho a no querer vivir en la ciudad a no querer sufrir la miseria de la ciudad. A los pobres que están allá, no, un, un poquito de arroz, un poquito de lentejas, decía el otro. O sea, comemos mejor nosotros. Eso es la dignidad para nosotros. La dignidad es lo que nosotros tenemos en el estómago. La dignidad es poder producir nuestros propios alimentos. Eso es lo que nosotros consideramos digno. Para mi pueblo y para mi tierra, dignidad es tener un plato de frijoles y un arepa al lado. Eso es dignidad para mí. Entonces, les hemos dicho, somos pacíficos, no es contra ellos, es contra el despojo que está implementando el Estado colombiano. Es contra la criminalización, contra el hecho de que nos estén diciendo que somos lo que no somos. Nosotros aquí no somos ni violentos, ni somos terroristas, somos gente de bien. 
Y esta es la prueba que necesitábamos también. Nosotros aquí no estamos haciendo nada, absolutamente nada, por lo que nos tengan que atropellar. Estamos aquí de manera pacífica, tranquila, dando un debate público que es un derecho constitucional. Nosotros no tenemos que pedirle permiso a nadie para reunirnos, para debatir. Eso es un ejercicio constitucional y cuando lo queramos hacer en la plaza pública, cuando lo queramos hacer en frente de la casa, a debatir los problemas de este país. ¿Y cuál es el gran problema de este país? Tierra para producir comida, tierra para los campesinos, tierra para nosotros vivir dignamente. Aguas, aguas para la vida y no para la muerte. Ese es el problema de este país, eso es lo que le estamos discutiendo. Pues las opciones que tenemos es hacer una expensa campesina, una que por ejemplo, yo creo que un ser humano con 5 hectáreas mantenga más o menos bien. Entonces van a caer más familias, va a haber más trabajo, va a haber más comida, porque la gente le va a trabajar más. Me gustaría que eso pasara como hemos venido siendo nosotros, ¿no? mi familia, que ha sido pasando de padres a hijos una cultura y la cual es muy bonita y yo la... Soy feliz ser campesino y me gusta que me digan campesino porque eso es lo que soy y eso es lo que sé hacer. Nosotros desde que empezamos este proceso, ese ha sido nuestro objetivo, o sea, que estas tierras eh, sean para una reserva campesina agroalimentaria. O sea, para nosotros, pues, como veníamos en ese cuento, porque las tierras pues, que, que van a ser inundadas en esta parte pues son 100% productivas y de ahí se sacaba prácticamente los alimentos para esta zona. Y ese es el, el objetivo que siempre hemos, eh, se, ha, se ha como fijado junto con, con, con la resistencia de, de crear una reserva campesina porque pues realmente tenemos la seguridad alimentaria por ese lado y son tierras que son 100% fértiles. Y, y somos más de, en el caso de las aguas, somos 250 familias y en la cual pues todos somos campesinos y, el, y, la, y la meta de nosotros pues es producir comida, ¿no? Para no, el mismo sustento de nosotros. Eh, en ese objetivo estamos, es, hemos visitado ya varios compañeros de donde hay reservas campesinas y, y para qué, o sea, eso, eso en, en bien común funciona, pero entonces para eso tenemos que liberar el territorio. Y en eso estamos. Ese es el objetivo que tenemos nosotros ahora. And the second is made by the Wayu communities in Venezuela on the Sokoy River. It's a fiction that they made about how the first coal mine was made there in the 1980s. Tatushi, my tatushi, my get the way, my dear, 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 my dear
Stuomo le te mai rangali hona mai ngali hona mai ngali hona mai mahaya wotto shi mai chi mai re wo yu re himari mai ngaku shi mai nichi kuwa mai ti mai ra no to shi mai no to shi mai no to Yara mai ra la mai ra ngala ha sa te mai ra ni kai ya la ga no to shi da sa ha ta ba la mai re te mai ra te kai ya la su ru mai re te ya mai ra bu e u chon kan mai ra te ya mai mai ke ra mai re da sa ha ta ba la ba ji mai re mai ke ta ya la da si shi ha mai ni ya mai ra ga o no shi ha ni ya mai ra no su la ha ha ji mai ra ni pi ya mai re ni pi ya mai re ni pi ya mai re No my chicken, no yellow hair, ring ha, my chamber, and my bullet, my never is a chamber, and my way over the little, my 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 little